On today's gangster profile, James Vincent Flemmy, aka Jimmy the Bear. Jimmy the Bear Flemmy, the Boston Underworld's first serial killer gangster, was a deranged psychopath, no doubt. One of those people that even if you were friends with him, he could still kill you at any moment. It really didn't matter if you were a friend or foe. If the bear was in a killing mood, death wasn't far away. Even though Jimmy the Bear spent most of his adult life in prison, when he was out on the street, I'm sure he made plenty of gangsters uncomfortable, to say the least. Most gangsters feared him for his unhinged violence, but the Italian Mafia viewed him as a heat-seeking missile for law enforcement, and also as a liability, because he had no discretion when it came to killing. Vincent James Flemmy, aka Jimmy the Bear, was born on September 5, 1935, to Italian immigrant parents. His father was rumored to, be, to have served in the Royal Italian Army in World War I. His father worked as a bricklayer in Boston, and they resided in the Roxbury neighborhood. To be exact, they lived in Orchard Park, which has always been a rough area. When they lived there, it was mostly run-down big tenement buildings before they were knocked down and the projects were built. He had two brothers, a one Michael Flemmy who would go on to become a Boston cop, and his other brother, Stevie the Reifman Flemmy, who would become one of Boston's most notorious criminals. The Bear and Stevie were referred to as a couple bad kids from Roxbury. When the Bear was still just a cub, his neighbors remembered him being quiet and odd. He would creepily giggle to himself about whatever was going on in his head. He used to laugh at disturbing things that weren't funny, and I bet he was probably one of those kids that used to torture and kill neighborhood cats. But that's just a hunch. The Bear's criminal career began in earnest in 1949 with a charge of malicious injury while he was still a juvenile. His first adult case and first trip to adult jail was for an assault against two naval officers of the USS Tarawa. There were a lot of sailors in Boston in the 50s because of the Charlestown Navy Yard. Fleming, along with three North End associates, brutally beat two officers of the USS Tarawa, leaving them permanently scarred, and the judge said it was one of the worst assaults he had ever witnessed. But because they were young and didn't have much of a record, he gave them six months. So in return, these dipshits appealed the sentence, and the judge said, you're right, that wasn't an adequate amount of time, and promptly sentenced them to two and a half years. Morons. Stevie definitely got the brains in the family, and that's really saying something. The bear was paroled in November of 56, and just a month later in December, he gets rearrested for a brazen violent armed robbery at the Boston and Albany Railroad Employees Credit Union at South Station. The bear and a companion burst in through the door brandishing handguns and tied a porter to a chair, taking his $70 that he had on him, and then hit the 68-year-old manager in the head, forcing him to open a safe. There was over $4,000 in the safe, which was a pretty good haul for back then. But the bear was quick, quickly apprehended, and while being arraigned, he realized he was going to go to prison for a while. He took off running. He actually made it out of the courthouse onto the street, where a bailiff, who unbeknownst to Jimmy was a standout Boston College football player, chased him down and laid him out on the sidewalk with a flying tackle. He held him there until the cops came, all the while Jimmy was punching, kicking, and biting him. The bear ended up getting sentenced to 7-12 to 12 years upstate. The bear was sent to the brand new Maximum Security Prison in Walpole, Mass. But even this place couldn't control the bear. He, along with 23 other prisoners, started a riot, and they were all shipped off to the hole at Concord Prison for a year. After he got out of there, the bear was back at Walpole. He was worse than before. Shortly after returning, he stabbed a model prisoner named Raven Gabriel in the back, killing him. It was in a crowded gymnasium, so they couldn't prove that the bear did it. While doing his bid, he made friends with an other prison frequent flyer, Joe Barbosa. The two of them were quite the dynamic duo. Together, they terrorized and bullied most of the other inmates. Back then, they used to give prisoners all types of crazy prescription drugs. Now you can't even get an Advil. Anyhow, they would wait by the med line and shake down every inmate for their pills. The bear just liked getting high in general, but he especially loved the heavy barbiturate tranquilizer second all. So I imagine that a typical night in Walpole for the bear and the animal would be to hang out, smack a couple inmates around, take their pills, get jammed, go steal some food from somewhere, gorge themselves, smoke a couple joints, and then go steal some unsuspecting buns. Even though Jimmy was in prison more than he was on the streets, when he was on the streets, he usually hung out with his brother Stevie and the Wimpy Bennett crew. Wimpy's crew hung out at his brother Walter's lounge. Wimpy Bennett was a notorious old-school gangster who controlled the rackets in Roxbury in the South End. Whether it was natural or influenced from their treacherous boss, the Flemmy boys would double-cross you in a second. Even though he was a deranged maniac, the bear had friends. He would do things like kick doors down and run up in people's apartments and attack large groups of people by himself. 
A lot of gangsters find this shit endearing. Some of the bear's closest friends were also sadistic killers, like John Mortarano. The bear wasn't always the best friend in return, though. Mortarano even let the bear hide in his apartment while on the lam. Now, the mafia asked the bear to kill Mortarano because Johnny was going around killing people without permission, and that's no good. Without hesitation, the bear said, sure. Now, whether he chickened out or was just too faded from scotch and second all, he didn't do it. And as he was getting out of the car, he dropped his revolver. Moderano put the gun back in his pocket and said, Hey buddy, chill out in the booze and pills, having no idea that he was supposed to be killed by that gun. In 1964, Jimmy the Bear was involved in the beef with Spike O'Toole of Dorchester, who was a McLaughlin associate. While going home for dinner like he did every night at 5.30, which his brother Stevie said was a foolish routine, around 10pm he left the house and two gunmen ambushed him, shooting him nine times with a 38 caliber handgun and a shotgun. It was most likely Spike O'Toole and Stevie Hughes of Charlestown. A doctor who lived nearby raced to the scene and kept him alive until he could be brought to the hospital. He miraculously survived, but he was a mess. He had tubes draining fluid from his lungs, a mesh bag holding in his stomach, and he had a colostomy bag. Surviving this made him more feared on the streets, though, and the newspaper dubbed him Iron Man Flemmy. Some of the Bears' more notorious crimes were gruesome murders. The ex-con Francis Benjamin made the mistake of trying to extort one of Wimpy Bennett's clients. So Wimpy implored Jimmy to take him out. He didn't need much pushing to kill someone. When Benjamin walked into Walter's lounge, the bear shot him in the head. After the bear realized that he used a police revolver and the bullet could be traced back to the cop, he came up with a simple solution, cut Benjamin's head off. He then dumped the headless corpse in the Southie Projects, which seems to be the favorite dumping place for gangsters. But then he wanted to keep the head as a trophy, or at least display it in a place of prominence. He had to be explained that that would defeat the whole purpose of chopping the head off. The cops were able to identify Benjamin by his fingerprints. His head was never recovered. Another murder was that of low-level criminal Iggy Lowry. The story goes Lowry set up some McLaughlin associates, and that's why he was murdered. But I've also heard that Lowry was sleeping with the bear's wife, and that would explain the gruesomeness of the murder. After Lowry entered Walter's lounge, the bear pounced on him and beat him to a bloody pulp, shot him in the head, and then for good measure slit his throat so deep that his head almost fell off. Stevie Flemmy and the bear took him out to Pembroke and dumped him in the woods. On the way back, Jimmy ran out of gas. Stevie was getting really worried about these lapses in judgment, and the mafia was beginning to see the, the bear as a liability. They ended up having to torch Walter's lounge after these two murders, because there was just too much evidence there. One more gruesome murder was when Jimmy killed George Ash. He stabbed him over 50 times and left his mutilated body in a car. Two on-duty police officers saw the bear leave the car, and upon inspecting it, they saw the dead body. Not wanting to do the paperwork, they pushed the car a few hundred yards across the Roxbury line so it was in a different patrol area. The bear got off scot-free. Oh, Boston's finest. It is a fact that the infamous murder of Teddy Deegan, one of Boston's biggest blemishes on law enforcement, stemmed from a beef with Jimmy the Bear. Threats were being hurled back and forth between Deegan and the bear. The bear was going around bad-mouthing Deegan to people, trying to turn them against him. Most people were afraid of the bear, but Deegan was a tough bastard from Chelsea who wasn't afraid of no man. Anyhow, the master thief was led to his demise under the guise of breaking into an office at night. He was murdered in an alley in Chelsea on the way to the fake robbery. Barboza the bear and three other men pulled off the murder. But Barboza perjured himself with false testimony and put four men to prison who had nothing to do with it. Two died while incarcerated. The most incredulous thing about this is that the FBI knew all of this before, during, and after the trial. It's also very important to add to this story that Jimmy the Bear was an FBI top echelon informant before his brother or Whitey Bulger. His handler was H. Paul Rico, one of the most corrupt law enforcement agents in history. It's not like the FBI didn't know what the bear was, and it also wasn't like it was out of sight, out of mind either. Jimmy, Jimmy openly talked about murder with Rico. He said, I want to be the number one hitman in Boston. I love killing people. It's better than hitting banks. Apparently, J. Edgar Hoover had even seen reports about Jimmy's crimes and still wanted him as an informant. The FBI and their pantyhose-wearing, mentally deranged director, J. Edgar Hoover, were so obsessed with the Italian mafia and the Black Panther Party that they didn't give two shits about a few low-life bums getting whacked in some shithole city, which was what Boston was in the 1950s and 60s. The only thing the FBI cared about was that Jimmy couldn't take money from the BPD while being paid by the FBI. Hey, you gotta have some sort of code now. 
The band tried to briefly open up a nightclub in the South End. It ended up just being a shooting gallery full of dope addicts, hookers, and dealers. His friends call it the Bear's Haunted House. On January 8th, the Bear met up with the Lebanese Black Jimmy Abbott. For whatever reason, the Bear pulled out a gun and tried to kill Black Jimmy. Hearing the pistol being cocked, Jimmy lunged at the Bear. When they were fighting, the gun went off, hitting the Bear in the shoulder and grazing his head. After Black Jimmy tried to reach out to make peace, the Bear said, You're a dead man. Black Jimmy was scared. He reached out to the MDC cop, Joe McCain. The bear fled and two years later was apprehended at a trailer park in Chicopee in Western Mass. Black, Black Jimmy went on to testify at trial and the bear was sent to prison. While in prison in 1975, the bear was permitted one of the first weekend furloughs by Governor Michael Dukakis in a new furlough program. The bear never came back and spent three years on the lam, probably doing speedballs and beating up women. He was eventually apprehended and sent back to prison. This would be the last time. In 1979, the bear's luck finally ran out. He died at the MCI Norfolk prison of a heroin overdose. The 44-year-old Flemmy was more of a maniac serial killer than a gangster in organized crime. At his funeral, his mother wept. Jimmy was such a good boy. He wouldn't hurt nobody. His brother, Stevie Flemmy, said, Ma, stop. He killed everyone. He wasn't a good boy. Now, if you like this video, hit that old like button, leave a comment, make a request, please subscribe if you haven't already, but most of all, take good care of yourself and have a great day.